ITS EVS 113 students, Dr. John Schrage here, and we are now moving forward with a new lecture about some important concepts that we're going to be working with really throughout this module. This module is really going to be about like wind and how we get the wind to blow, but in order to understand the forces that are going to be at work to make the wind blow, we're going to need to have a pretty clear understanding of the idea of pressure. Now, if I were going to kind of I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you before I tell you. I'm going to tell you that this, this lecture here has a real theme to it. And that theme is that there's two ways to think about pressure. And both of the ways are right. And both of the ways are going to be important to understanding things that happen in this class. And again, just to kind of give you a little preview, one of those things, one of those ways to think about pressure in the atmosphere is to visualize pressure as the force that's being exerted by lots and lots of little air molecules as they hit the surface at a given moment. Now that's in contrast to a second way to think about pressure that's also very useful in certain contexts and so on, and that is to think about pressure as the weight of the air that is above you. Now that's going to take a little bit more thinking to understand, but that won't come until later in this lecture and so on. But as you're going to see, it's going to turn out to be important to be able to visualize what pressure means in both of these two ways. Hold on, there we go. Alright, so let's start picking apart this idea that was that first way of thinking about pressure, and that is that pressure is the weight, is sorry, is the force of all these little air molecules zipping around. Now we've already learned that of course, air is made of gases, and that's what gases do, is that the individual molecules zip around, and they, they, they fly through the space, and they hit each other, and they move around. And they're actually cooking along pretty fast. I may not have mentioned it already, but just to give you an example, at a typical air temperatures of, like, room temperature, air molecules are moving around at about a thousand miles per hour. So those individual molecules, while very small, are each moving pretty fast. And see how I, like, I, I kind of try to sketch in here a little area of like a table or something like that. Obviously it's very small. And you can see I'm trying to draw like little molecules bouncing. They hit that surface quite hard because they're moving at like a thousand miles per hour and they are bouncing off of it. And well, candidly, there's a lot of air molecules. Air is surprisingly dense stuff. We'll come to a more technical definition of the word dense in a little bit, but air is pretty dense stuff. There's about uh, 10 to the 22nd power molecules per liter of air. A liter of air, like a half of a two liter bottle, and uh, 10 to the 22nd power, that's one followed by 22 zeros. Okay, so that's a lot, that's a very big number. And that is about how many air molecules there are per liter. Now, in the ATS-114 lab, if you take that, you've learned more about things like how that's related to temperature and how far a typical molecule goes before it hits another molecule. That's the so-called mean free path, none of which we're going to get into in this lecture here. But I want you to get this idea, then these molecules are zipping around and they hit surfaces. And at any given moment of time, a lot of air molecules are hitting a particular surface. And while it's true that each individual molecule, when it hits the surface, doesn't exert all that much force, when you're talking about millions and millions and millions of molecules hitting hard, together they exert a lot of force. I like to tell students it's kind of like imagining, uh, imagine you're in a lecture hall and you all have ping pong balls, and you're going to throw the ping pong balls at the wall. If you throw a ping pong ball at the wall, one wall, one student is throwing a ping pong ball at the wall is not going to do anything. But if there was enough students throwing enough ping pong balls hard enough, you could knock the wall over, right? In the same sort of way, these individual air molecules are not exerting that much force, but taken together with so many molecules hitting so hard, it adds up to a really adds up to a lot of force. Now. There's a standard trick that educators do when they want to illustrate this, and it's called the can crushing video. Well, no, it's the can crushing experiment, and probably your high school science teacher either did it or showed you a video about it or whatever, and for purposes of an online course, I recorded a video of me doing the can crushing experiment. This is actually a couple years ago, and I used to have students actually follow a link to watch it separately, but let, I'm just going to go ahead and embed that video right now. are you've seen this demonstration in your science classes someplace else in your education, but it bears mentioning in this ATS-113 course. 
In this demonstration, we're going to be cr crushing aluminum cans using air pressure. And this is just demonstrating how great air pressure really is all around us. We're going to start off with a couple of aluminum cans sitting on a burner. And there's a small quantity of water in each of these cans. They're each filled up maybe uh, a half inch or something like that. And we're going to heat the cans until the water's boiling. Next to the cans, we're going to have a container of ice water. And this is going to be where we're going to transfer the cans once the water in the can is boiling. When you do these kind of experiments, make sure you follow all the safety precautions, make sure you have some kind of uh, protection for your hands because the cans will and the water inside the cans will be very hot. It'll be easy to burn yourself on the burner. I don't worry I wouldn't worry about protective eyewear. Things aren't going to go flying. All right, once the water in the cans is boiling, we transfer the can to the water and it crushes. If we go and look at another one, this time in slow motion, you can see that the air pressure around the can is crushing the can. The question is why? On the following three uh, on the following three flash videos, you will see why this happened. This has been Dr. John Shrug, copyright 2005. Under pressure. Under pressure. Pressure. Isn't that really interesting? Some, for some reason, the can crushed. Now, it takes a lot of force to crush a can like that. In fact, if you noticed in the video there, those cans were really crushed into a tiny little ball, uh, so more so than you would do even with your hand or something like that. Why did those cans crush? Well, it's gonna have to do with air pressure. And what I wanna do now is I wanna pick apart how that can crushing happened. If we wanted to do this now, oh gosh maybe like 12 years ago now or something like that, I actually created some flash animations that illustrated what's happening here. Now, in the years since, flash has kind of fallen out of favor. Your browser may not even have the flash extensions installed. So I'm uh, embedding them here as a video, but if you want links to the actual flash animations, so you can watch them and take them apart and look more closely, the link is actually here on the slide as well. It's that little Google link that's on there. But before we, hit the can we, we uh, start with this can uh, here, I want to show you what's going on. So before the can was heated here with my little animation, see I have those air molecules moving around and so on, and from time to time, a molecule is hitting the can on the outside. Now, in fact, in the real world, it would be happening zillions of times per second, but I can't animate that. So from time to time, a single air molecule is bouncing off the outside of the can. But notice the can is open to the outside world. It's already been opened, and on the inside of the can, there's air. It's not a vacuum on the inside of the can, there's air inside of there. And those air molecules are also moving around, and they hit the inside of the can pushing out. And so before our ex experiment even starts, when the can is just sitting there open, there is air there's air pressure on the outside pushing in, and there's an equal amount of air pressure on the inside pushing out, and nothing happens to the can. It's not very exciting. Then what we're going to do is we're going to heat the can. Now, in the experiment uh, that I showed you in the video, I actually did it on a gas stove at my house. Um, in a classroom, we often would bring in like a little Bunsen burner or something like that to do it. Here I have sort of like, that's supposed to look like the filaments of an electric oven, uh, electric stove top, cooking the can there, whatever. Now, before we started the experiment, we put a little water in the bottom of the can. And as we heat the can like this, what's happening is we are converting some of that liquid water into steam. Steam is also a gas, of course. And those steam molecules are going to push the air molecules mostly out of the can through the open top. Now, that means that after a few minutes of being on that burner there, you will see that the, nothing is happening to the can. There's still air molecules on the outside of the can pushing in, trying to crush the can. But there are steam molecules on the inside, a perfectly useful gas, bouncing against the inside walls of the can, pushing outward on the can. They're pushing outward just as much as the air molecules on the outside are pushing inward and nothing happens to the can. There's a force balance involved. All right, so we have heated the can. Okay, it's not full of air anymore, it's full of steam, but in all other ways, it's just like before we heated the can. Then what we're gonna do, and again, you can switch to, you can actually follow that little link if you want to and actually work with the animation if you happen to have uh, flash installed. We're gonna transfer that can over to the ice. Now, 
As you saw when we watched that video, once the can hit the ice, it crushed. What actually happens here is once you put the can into the ice, the can cools quickly and the steam that's inside the can quickly changes back into liquid water. Which means for a short period of time, there's no gas inside of the can. Now, quickly air is going to flow back in through the front, of the, through the uh, opening at the top of the can and so on, but it all happens too fast. For a short period of time, there's a vacuum inside the can because we have changed the steam inside the can back into a liquid. So there are still air molecules on the outside of the can pushing in, but now there's no air molecules on the inside of the can pushing out, and you get this terrible animation of the can getting crushed. And you saw in the video, I mean, it's quite dramatic. Right? There's now no air molecules on the inside of the can pushing out, and so there's no longer a force balance, and the air pressure around the can crushes it. Now you can go to YouTube and find all kinds of really cool examples where cooler professors than I uh, have done this to like 50 gallon oil drums over a campfire and you know you get this huge crush and so on. But this is a pretty cool thing and I encourage you to try it. I would be glad to talk to anybody who wants to chat about how to do it safely and how to get the results they want because it does take a little bit of practice to get the experiment right. So it was the air pressure around the can that crushed the can. And as you know from trying to crush a can with your hand, it's not a simple thing to crush a can. It takes a fairly large amount of pressure. So clearly the pressure of the air around us is actually pretty great. Now as we move on to part two of this lecture, we'll actually talk more about pressure and how to quantify the amount of pressure and so on in the atmosphere. This force of all these molecules pressing on a surface. But before we do that, let's answer three quick questions. Question one. When an empty can of soda was just sitting there, okay, sorry, an empty can of soda was just sitting there on the counter, why doesn't the air around, I'm sorry, this is an air parcel, why doesn't the air in the environment around it crush the can? I don't really like the way I worded that question. A, there's just as much pressure on the inside pushing outwards. B, the soda can is strong enough to resist the pressure of the air in the room. Or C, actually the air around the can is crushing it, just happening really slowly. Which of those three is the correct answer as to why the can is not crushing when it's just sitting there on the counter? Make a choice from those three options and get a little feedback before you move on to question two.